Are L2 tokens going to go up in price, or are they just worthless governance tokens? This was the question posed in the in the Bankless Discord that I mentioned earlier. And I, I want to give you uh, some takes here, David, and see how mm-hmm. much you kind of uh, agree. And maybe we'll take this in pieces here. But just to set the stage, um, I do have a bias, I would say, okay? And like everyone, hopefully, if you're an investor in the space, you're not just being whipped around by the winds of like whatever the most popular narrative, narrative, is. narrative is. Hopefully you have narrative a season bias, <laughs> aka a thesis, like you have right. some sort of conviction. Concept for the understanding the world. Yeah. And so my biases, let's call them, are um, one, long-term time horizons, right? So I'm not a narrative uh, trader. I'm yeah. talking when I'm in the context of this, two to seven year intervals, okay? This is different. If you're doing narratives, you're doing like three to 12 month time horizons. So for the listeners, this may not be your time horizon. You want to do mm-hmm. narrative, there's a different play. But what I'm right. saying probably is just like not relevant to you because I, you know it's a different time horizon. The second thing I would say is I weigh something called fundamentals highly in my investment. And I, mm-hmm. I don't want to like sound, um, hmm, how, how do I put this? I have a specific- yeah, high and mighty. Yeah. Oh, I, I cool here's the now. fundamentals. I, <laughs> what do you? Uh, my you're just a narrative thesis trader. is fundamentals. <laughs> yeah, okay, because because there's holes with the idea of fundamentals, right? So right. I have a your specific... fundamentals are not everyone else's fundamentals. Exactly, and fundamentals are just like a consensus uh, technology right. at the end of the day, and right. So what I'm trying to do is get everyone else to agree to my fundamentals. And... My my fundamentals are better than your fundamentals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But mine are better, dude. No, <laughs> um, that's why that's why we talk about them. <laughs> my specific definition of fundamentals is for chains that sell blocks. Right, this would be an alternative layer one or a layer two, uh, long term profitability. That's the fundamental I look, which we just talked about mm-hmm. what that means. It's the revenue that the chain brings in by selling blocks, less its costs, which are the amount that it pays for, for uh, gas to the parent chain or the amount that it issues. Like, remember, alternative layer ones, they have to pay for their security. They don't pay Ethereum for their security. So what do they do? They issue block rewards. They issue new supply of their token to pay for that security. Okay. That to me is the most ungameable metric, profitability is the most ungameable metric for proof of value creation for mm-hmm. a chain. All right? right. Now, this may if not money be- money flows from elsewhere into yeah. your vault and you can measure that, that is fundamentals. I mean, this is kind of how equities like are valued, right? It's like, right. I, you know, of course, there's cash nomadic flows value. and perceived growth ratios. Discounted cash flows over time, right? That is at least some utility value consensus that the market kind of believes, right? So, but this may not be the way the market decides to value blockchains anytime in the near future or even in the fullness of time. I don't know. Maybe there's some other fundamental that becomes more important, right? Maybe active addresses become kind of the the metric or something else becomes more important. So I'm looking at this from a PL uh, perspective. So caveats aside, my take on um, L2s is that they are positioned incredibly well for their tokens to accrue value. All right. So are L2 tokens bullish? Are they going to go up in price? My take is when I look at this, yes. All right. And here's why. Three reasons for this. One, and this is probably the most important, David, they have a 100x more advantage in the block space profit game because they don't have to pay for their security through issuance right. of the base token, all right? It is a cheat code. For, They're just value-added value resellers, capital. right? Yeah. Instead of like Ethereum's bootstrapping- doing the hard work. Instead of bootstrapping their own military and you know court service right. and police force and all of these things- Ryan, they Ryan just means security that. and smart contracts and mm-hmm. ecosystem. Exactly. Uh, they just take all of that and then they resell it. And they can resell mm-hmm. both layer one block space and data availability block space. So they could go take Celestia and resell it. Right. They could go take which, Ethereum which and resell it. just started doing. Yeah, they could go take Eigen DA and resell it. And that's what they're doing. And so they're always going to be more profitable than somebody who is issuing their native token. Like just look at the PLs. Just look at right. cost going. So they have an advantage there that I think is hard to compete with. Now, this is a caveat, and this is where the kind of the second comes in, right? It it is dependent on their ability to attract users and capital mm-hmm. to their execution environments. So mm-hmm. if they get outplayed by an alternative layer one or some layer one that is better able to capture users and capital, okay? Mindshare adoption, 
uh, trust brand. It won't yeah. matter. A, a, right. An L2 zombie chain is just still a zombie chain and it's not producing right. revenue or profits. And if an L alternative layer one is able to kind of capture that value, then they won't. Now, I, I would just say, what have we just seen? I mean, we looked at the numbers. Uh, we've seen traction for Arbitrum, for OP, for Polygon, for Base, for ZK Sync. And they have uh, shown that mm -hmm. their rates of, of accruing uh, users and, and traction are even exceeding their L1 competitors. So right. I, I don't think you can say alternative layer ones are just going to attract users and capital at a far faster rate. I think that's right. already been disproven at this point in the market. Like, nah, L2's You're, you're saying it's game. being disproven as in it's the only strategy that can do that. It is exactly. it's still it's still happening. It's still in the mix for sure. Right. And there's and so still for people who race. are valuing uh, layer ones who are negative in economics, as in they're issuing more uh, tokens than they are accruing in fees, the market is assigning a growth premium, a, a PE ratio for layer ones who are it, like uh, operating at a loss in, in order to incentivize growth, which is a tried and true strategy that we've seen for decades. And so, yeah, this and people generally, I would say, ascribe high PE ratios to layer ones. Exactly. And so I'm just making the case that um, L2s are not positioned to be uh, valueless governance tokens. Not necessarily right. that they will exceed uh, alternative layer ones, but you, you can see that they're doing a lot in terms right. of traction. The last piece on this kind of worthless governance stakes is I am not bearish on governance tokens, okay? So if you think about equities, David, what are equities? Uh, governance, governance tokens with cash governance flows. Governance certificates with pieces of paper. Exactly. But they have some sort of legal guarantee to cash flows. Right. So mm -hmm. long as the governance token has a code-based guarantee eventually to cash flows, to me, that is a value accruing uh, device. Okay. We'll contrast this with something like um, the Uni token right now. Does not have a fee switch. There are transaction fees and value accrual mechanisms that can happen outside of the protocol. Mm -hmm. It is closer to like a, a worthless governance token, although I do think the fee switch will be turned on. Uh, I think for, for layer twos, it's going to be much closer to layer ones in that you have a sequencer which accrues all of the profit, you know, basically, and that profit is just going to be passed on in the form of staking, let's say, mm -hmm. or in the form of like a work utility token. Right, this is what mm -hmm. Matic is is moving towards for for Pole, and I think we see other chains kind of moving to this type of model to uh, essentially enable the token holder to participate in that on chain cash flow. So, it's a governance token with cash flows. I think that's right. what we're seeing emerging here, and that's why I would say it's different. So, what's your what's your what, or that's that's why I would say L two tokens are actually bullish as long as they continue to have this these positive revenues. New user base, um, you know, usage, uh, and that number goes up. Then I mm -hmm. see the token accruing value. What's your take on that? Yeah, you you said L two tokens are governance tokens with cash flows. I would just amend that just a slight uh, in a slight way, just to L two tokens are governance tokens over cash flows. That's the thing that they govern over. That's right. And so, like the base case is what I would say Arbitrum currently is which is you can go look at the smart contracts of Arbitrum and you can see Ether flowing into the Arbitrum sequencer vault, which is governed by the Arbitrum DAO. And so if you are an ARB token holder, you have some amount of say over where that money goes. And I think it's really the next phase of the value capture conversation is like, well, it's up to governance to apply that capital in value added ways in the most uh, in, the, in the highest ROI possible, and so sitting in the treasury is one thing, but you know, let's take Amazon for example. What did Amazon do with its money? It just sent it right back into the company. It incentivized growth, which was a good strategy. Uh, is that Arbitrum strategy? Uh, I don't know. Arbitrum governance will have to determine what is the best way to incentivize growth using the capital that it's receiving. But the thing is, is like Arbitrum is cash flow positive. And so now it's kind of up to Arbitrum treasury management and just like DAO governance, which is, you know, what crypto is, to apply that capital uh, in a way that grows, is accretive to Arbitrum even more. And yep. we're so early into crypto. What is it? 20, it's 2024. Arbitrum is how many years old? Uh, five? Actually, wow, five years. Um, in the grand scheme of things, we're at the very beginning of these things. 
Uh, and so we still have, um, I don't know, 98% of the world left to capture, 99% of the world left to capture and get on chain. Uh, and so these treasuries, these positive treasuries that are uh, being accrued by layer twos need to go to capture the remaining 99% of yeah, people that are not on chain yet. I mean, w when it's in treasury, uh, you can uh, distribute it by, by almost mm -hmm. like a dividend to those who are staking, right. those token holders. So th this is kind of, I think the, the, con the convergence of this is we will have a kind of a network type equity or an internet type equity that returns funds to the holders of these tokens in the same way that like equities in uh, you know traditional capital markets are a right for governance over cash flows. Uh, and so like that's similar to me. And the last thing is listeners might say, well, but like none of that matters right now. Like PLs don't matter. No one's actually looking at it like this. Here's a reason I think people might start to list like look at it like this. Block space mm -hmm. fees, David, they're going to commoditize and collapse to zero. That that is my like, belief. Layer two fees are going to zero. Yes, for all chains except for master chains. settlement chains like Ethereum. Yeah. Okay. Cause Ethereum yeah. is doing a different service. It is providing yeah. settlement, it's taking its block space, and it's selling it to a whole bunch of chains. But the chains themselves, right? The roll-ups, the layer twos themselves, their fees will collapse to zero. You just see it right now. Look at the DA layers. We, yeah. We're just talking about uh, Lyra. We're just right? at the very beginning of the DA wars. It's getting. It was like what ninety nine percent cheaper or ninety percent cheaper. Ninety five percent cheaper. Yeah. And then Eigenlayer DA comes in. That's going to make it another like you know ninety percent cheaper uh, again. We've got paralyzed VMs, which are going to increase our tr transaction throughput. We've got m massive advances in compression. Vitalik has talked about this. We've got zk tech. The bottom line is, I think block space. Execution layer block space is going to turn into a complete commodity product. And so if you're an L1 and you're trying to generate profitable block space in this environment, or you're trying to differentiate yourself on low fees, I don't think that's going to be a differentiator for you anymore. Right. And it's so like, it is true that block ordering, MEV, can be a source of revenue. And I think that that could be a source of revenue in the future for alternative layer ones, but it is also a source of revenue for layer twos. And if you, have too much MEV extraction and block ordering, users are going to leave your chain. They don't want the slippage cost. They don't want the sandwich attacks. They're going to go to somewhere where they don't have those types of hidden, let's call them transaction fees. So that is like the last point I would say on how this I see this game evolving from a you know blockchain commodity perspective. I think everything we've talked about, Ryan, um, is the bottom of the pyramid, if you will, the fundamental uh, foundation that all value future value capture of layer two stands upon. Uh, the long, the reason why these layer twos work at all over the longest amount of terms is what we've talked about so far in this episode. I call that the bottom of the pyramid because then there's n another uh, layer of uh, why will tokens go up, which is a more of a medium short term narrative, like the than narrative. The narrative trade. Yeah. The narrative, right? So the reasons why people are going to buy these tokens now. In the this cycle, uh, short, in 2024. The, this cycle, the short term amnesia that crypto has when it's a bull market. And so I think there's plenty of reasons, uh, which are valid reasons, by the way. Like brand is one of these reasons. And so I want to talk about that middle section, the narrative trade. I'm not, I'm not a trader. You're not a trader. I don't look at charts. So that's not what we're going to talk about. But I want to talk about like kind of the next shorter term phase of like what happens when you have fundamentals. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over 300,000 fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.